Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Um, magandang gabi sa iba sa inyo. I don't know if uh, some are watching from other places. And, and I would just say magandang araw po sa ating lahat. Napakaganda ng araw namin dito sa, sa Denmark. The sun is fully out. So another day the Lord has given us having a um, um Sa, sa, sa kanyang kanta na we have another day given to us by our Lord. Well, um, I would like to welcome our um, listeners today sa ating FB streaming. Meron din tayong um, visitors and um, I, I guess it will be a little bit challenging this afternoon from, from uh, Nepal. We have uh, Brother Sunil Sretha. Welcome to our service. I hope this won't be the last time that we'll be uh, joining us. And just everyone, um, welcome to this afternoon's service. Let us start off with a prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for another day you have given us. Thank you for gathering us. Thank you for the platform that you have given us, the technology. And we pray that nothing will go wrong today. I know that everything is in your hands. Truly, Lord Jesus, as we started today's uh, service in the words of Siske, she mentioned um, what Paul said in Ephesians 1.18. His prayer was, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. That is my prayer today, Lord Jesus. May our eyes be opened, our hearts be opened, our minds be opened only to your word because it is you who will be speaking to us today. Lord, I am not an expert on this topic, but because you are the one speaking, everyone will understand, Lord God. Just use me as your tool, your footstool today. This I ask in the mighty name of Jesus with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Yeah, so we are reading something about um, a topic that many will say is quite controversial and, and maybe some of you are asking now just by, by the, the scripture um, verses from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. Why did Shirley or why did Elder Shirley choose this topic at this very um, time in our country where, where in we are experiencing financial distress in so many places around the world because of the pandemic. But I would like to, to tell you that the topic about wealth is really very significant. The Bible alone has more than 2000 verses referring to money and wealth and material possessions. There are only 500 verses, you know, um, more or less regarding prayer. And there are less verses which talk about um, heaven, right? And, and, and around or nearly 25% of Jesus' teachings in the New Testament are about material possessions and the management of our wealth. And then, I don't know if you know that there are 16 out of the 38 parables that Jesus said are all about money and then our stewardship of this wealth that the Lord has, has given us. So why did I choose this topic? It's because there is a direct correlation between our money, our wealth, our material possessions with our faith. It's either people, it's either that they worship wealth or they worship the Lord with their wealth. There is a big difference in that. So it's a significant topic in the Bible. And there are many biblical truths which I will be um, giving you um, as we go along with the passage, uh, sorry, with the message today. And then we'll be reminded of our Christian duties regarding our wealth management. Again, I'm saying I'm not an expert in wealth management or financial management. Maybe some of you have taken courses on that, but I just believe that I'm taking, taking up this topic because it is relevant in today's world. And then I would like to point out some misconceptions and mis misperceptions regarding 
the, the material possessions we have, right? And how to go about with them. And finally, like I said, it is quite relevant in the pandemic that we are experiencing right now, not only in the Philippines, in Dubai, but all around the world. So no matter how many verses there are in the Bible about money and wealth, I can say to all of you that money is amoral. Pag sinabi natin, when we say amoral, we say that money doesn't have any concern regarding its behavior, whether it is right or wrong. Why? Because money has no life. We know that. Money cannot act on its own. It cannot do good deeds. It cannot commit crimes. So where does the problem lie? Money will only do what man tells it to do. So money is not the root of all evils, but the love of man, money is. And this is what we, we can read in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. So money is immoral, but it is our attachment to it and our worship of it that leads us to sin. Okay. So this afternoon, because of these um, reasons why I'll be talking about wealth today, I have entitled my message, God's Overflowing Wealth for You. Because this is true, brothers and sisters. You may believe it or not, God has overflowing wealth for each one of us. Now, there is an interesting layout of these verses which we read today. Because in chapter six, in chapter six, Paul was telling Timothy about the things that he should tell to the Ephesians, right? So this is actually the last chapter. And what we read today is, or are verses 17 to 19. But look at verses 11 to uh, 16. You might think actually that this chapter already ends here. If I may read it fast, but you man of God, free from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, whenever we hear the word Amen, it's always the conclusion. Amen is a Hebrew word, which means concurrence, or you are in agreement, or you are affirming. So Paul saying this and putting an amen after his exhortation, right? One would think that it was the end. In fact, it is entitled the final charge to, to Timothy. But why is it that after this amen, these three verses which we have read today came next? I have read a little bit about this. It says, that there is a great significance. Paul would like to reiterate to Timothy the big significance and importance of the topic which is being talked about in verses 17 to 19, and that is material wealth. And Paul didn't want to forget that. He underscored the importance of this topic which Timothy should tell to the Ephesians. That is why after that Amen, these three verses came again. And there are two more verses 
um, uh, Paul saying, may the grace of the Lord be with you. But this one is actually the final charge of Paul to Timothy. So that is the layout. And that is why I, I chose this because I thought of its relevance in, in today's world. So let's go to verse 17. Hima hima in punatinto. Let us try to extract the words which are here. Verse 17 says, command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Let us have a look at the word command. This is such a powerful word. I took a look at all the other versions of this verse. In King James Version, the word that's being used is charge them. When you charge somebody, you impose on somebody. New American Standard Bible says instruct those, instruct to give instruction. The Living Bible uses a slightly weaker word, which is just tell. Tell those who are rich, yeah? But the contemporary English version uses the words warn the rich. This is more powerful, actually. When you warn somebody, you are somehow telling that person that there will be negative consequences if you do not do what was warned to you. So command. This gives us an idea what heavy, what big task um, Paul was giving Timothy at that time, right? You see, in, in, this, in, in this chapter, chapter six, Paul was actually telling Timothy of all the other things that Timothy would say to the, to the Ephesians. Um, Paul was talking about um, serving the, the, the servants, serving the masters well, that they should respect their masters, that people should um, worship in, in a way that is more um, glorifying to God, that people should um, pray in, in, um, in, in secret, that um, uh, Timothy should help the churches there to select their church leaders in, 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 you know, having a look at the qualities that would make a good church leader. There are so many things that's being taught to Timothy there to be said to the Ephesians. And then the, the final church actually was a lot about money, a lot about wealth, a lot about management of the material possessions that God has given us. So, it is quite quite a, a, a big part of the Bible, this um, chapter six of First Timothy. Now, the second part of chapter, uh, sorry, of verse 17 is, who are the rich in this world? Kasi sabi ni, sabi ni, ni Paul, command the rich in this present world. All right. Let's look at the Ephesians, because this message was actually to the Ephesians, all right? Now, during that time, the Ephesians or the, the Ephesus was said to be the Bank of Asia during that time. Remember that this message was given to Timothy by Paul more than 2,000 years ago. And, and at that time, Ephesus was a very, very rich city. Why was it rich? It was rich because it was like called the Bank of Asia at that time. Yeah, the people actually indulged in idolatry. They believed more about um, the Greek god Artemis and then the, the, the Roman counterpart of that god is Diana. And who are these goddesses? They are the goddesses of childbirth, the goddesses of wild animals and hunting. And many people believed in these goddesses and they believed in idols. And because of these goddesses, many people came to Ephesus to worship these goddesses. And that tourism of, you know, created so much wealth for Ephesus and the city acquired so much wealth 
because of the production of these idols, yeah? So that's why Ephesus has become so rich. Now, time and again, Paul has been telling the Ephesians that the Ephesians should actually give more importance to a far greater wealth, wealth more than this material um, wealth they had. That is the wealth in Christ. He wanted them to draw on their inheritance, you know, and use it for God's glory. Later on, you will see in Revelation, um, um, Ephesus is one of the churches by which John talked about. What was the problem in this church in Ephesus? They have forgotten their first love instead of they have idolized other goddesses. But the Ephesians were quite rich during that time in that world when Paul and Timothy were well, talking about in this, in this verse that we read. Looking at our present world now, let's put this into perspective. We are now in our present world. Who are the rich? Let me talk about the millionaires and billionaires. I did a little research on this and I think it would be interesting for you um, brothers and sisters to know that in the world today, there are 2,755 billionaires in the world. I'm talking about billionaires only. Five of them, uh, sorry, four of them are Americans, one from France. The accumulated money of these billionaires is amounting to 13.1 trillion, trillion, okay? So the, the money of Jeff Bezos, he's the richest man on earth right now. He has 197 billion US dollars. He's followed by Elon Musk. Um, you, you know, um, Jeff Bezos, he's the CEO of Amazon, followed by Elon Musk, he is the CEO of Tesla. Then we have Bernard Arnault, that's the French who is the, the, the founder and, and owner of all these brands, Louis Vuitton, Marc um, Christian Dior and all that. Also Carrefour, he owns that. And then of course we have Bill Gates who is the um, founder of Microsoft. And of course, lastly, we, uh, number five, we have Mark Zuckerberg, the, the CEO of Facebook. Now this money they have actually constitutes, yeah? Their money constitutes 22% of the world's wealth. So these are the richest people in the world. And you would be surprised brothers and sisters to know that in the Philippines, do you know that we have 15 billionaires? I haven't really um, memorized their names, but I know you, you know the Villars, the Tans and the Sikhs, you know? And, um, the Philippines has 7.8 billion, sorry. The Philippines has 110.8 million people. And the Philippines only has got um, a, a, a small amount of money and that money accumulated from these 15 billionaires in the Philippines compri comprises 22% of the money in the Philippines. So, you are hearing that the Philippines is a poor country? No, you're not. It's a conception and it's one misperception, brothers and sisters. Who are the rich in this present world? If we talk about wealth and if it will be defined as a suitable accumulation of resources and possessions of value, then we talk about the millionaires and billionaires. And who says that it's suitable? It's man. We are the ones putting this definition of a millionaire and billionaire. If you have six zeros, you know, in your bank account and then nine zeros billionaires. And then of course there are, you know, combined your, your money, the money of the country will become into trillions. But who has given this definition of wealth? It's man. Over the years, the definition of, of wealth and being rich has evolved. But then the, the word wealth and being rich is very relative. It has so many factors in it. There are so many things to be considered before one is considered rich or poor. I wrote here, us, are we rich in this present world? 
And we are said to be the middle class because we are neither millionaires, we're neither billionaires. I, I don't know, maybe some of you have um, millions in your, in your bank account. But I put a question mark because, because there is no definite standard on, on, on why we call ourselves middle class or poor or wealthy. Wealthy, Like what I said, it is very relative. It actually depends on where you are, you know? Let's take, for example, this, put it into context. If you have $100 in the US, it's $100. If you are in Dubai, your $100 is only 360 dirhams. But if you are in the Philippines, your $100 is 4,832 pesos. That's a big amount of money. It's not a big amount of money in, in, um, in Dubai. In Denmark, my $100 would be 600 krona. So it is not really easy to put a distinction between the rich and poor because somebody who has $100 and you are from Zimbabwe, you will have 100 trillion Zimbabwe dollars. You will have tons and tons of suitcases of, of money in your suitcases. And yet, and yet, you will not be able to afford to buy a loaf of bread. What I'm saying is true, brothers and sisters. The Zimbabwean, Zimbabwean dollar is not even recognized as an official currency in the world. Sinako na ang pera, pero hindi maka-afford ang mga taga Zimbabwe ng isang loaf of bread, kahit na millionaires na sila. So you see, there is a, a very, very big difference between being poor and being rich. Somebody who has grown in a very wealthy family, ang poor sa kanila ay wealthy na sa isang poor family. So you really not, cannot put a distinction in that. And that's why I said that we are in the middle class or are we rich? Now, we, before we go to the biblical explanation of how it is or what is a rich person in the Bible, there is a very famous uh, Bible scholar, his name is David Cotter, who has given us a definition of who is wealthy. He says, one is wealthy to the extent that one has sufficient food of good quality, clothing appropriate to keeping cool or warm, and shelter for protection from the elements. Yan ang sinasabi niyang wealthy. Pag merong pagkain, when we have food of good quality, we have clothing to protect us, and then we have shelter. That's already a description of one who is wealthy. It's if you have studied psychology, once you have fulfilled the basic uh, needs that you have, if you remember the pyramid, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, once you have fulfilled the basic needs, then you are already wealthy. All right? Let's at what is wealthy in the Bible. From the Bible, we are given a perspective that we are wealthy. The Bible tells us that the most important item of wealth was food. So the more farmland or flocks, animals you had, the more well off you were. So food was a matter of life and death then. There was no McDonald's, brothers and sisters. There was no means of refrigeration during that time. So once you have food, and because that is the biggest indicator of wealth, you are already rich and wealthy. So this is why the promised land was described as a land of, a land flowing with milk and honey. If you were rich enough to have extra, you could trade for horses or embroidered clothing and rare jewels. 
each as a symbol of wealth. So let me repeat this. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, brothers and sisters, in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Genesis, and Numbers, you will read around 20 verses with a phrase, land flowing with milk and honey being referred to as the promised land. Let's look at Exodus 3.8. This was um, time of Moses, and I come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites, land flowing with milk and honey. Let's go to Numbers. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Numbers, if the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. And then Deuteronomy, when I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, the land I promised an oath to their ancestors. And when they eat, they are fill and thrive. They will turn to other gods and worship them, rejecting me and breaking my covenant. The promised land, the rich, the wealthy land promised by God is a land flowing with milk and honey. So... This poetic description of the promised land, Israel, emphasizes the fertility of the soil and bounty that awaited God's chosen people. Remember this, fertility of the soil. So the reference to milk suggests that many livestock could find pasture there. And the mention of honey suggests the vast farmland available the bees had plenty of plants to draw nectar from. So it follows. There is fertile soil and there is vast farmland where the livestock dwell, right? So God's description of the promised land as a land flowing with milk and honey is a beautifully graphic way of highlighting the agricultural richness of the land. God brought his people out of slavery in Egypt to a prosperous land of freedom and blessing and the knowledge of the Lord. So based on this, brothers and sisters, if there is food and if there is clothing, that is the status quo. That is actually the description of a wealthy man according to the scripture. And let me add to this. First Timothy chapter six, seven and eight, it says, for we have brought nothing into the world so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, meaning food and clothes, with these we shall be content. That means we have everything we need. So what is the status quo? Food and clothing equals rich. Anything less than you are poor. Anything extra and in excess than you are rich. So brothers and sisters, if you, are, if you are listening to me right now, I can truly say that you are wealthy by God's standards. Honor him with your worldly success. If I let each one of you go to your closets, you will find lots and lots of clothes there which are not used even. You have an, a phone right now. That means you have more than food and clothing. You have a phone, you can listen to me. If you go to your refrigerator not right now, I promise you, you will find lots of food in there. Not only one kind of, um, a sandwich spread, you have peanut butter there, you have a jam, you have Nutella and everything. There is wealth abounding in us, brothers and sisters. Now, this is the more important thing. 
Sabi ni Paul to Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world. What are the commands? First command. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. That means we have to be humble. We should not think of ourselves as better than others because of our material wealth. It's so sad, brothers and sisters. Some people do that. We think so highly of ourselves. We think that we are of greater value than others because of the amount of money that we have. For some, it is incredibly difficult really to define, to be wealthy, sorry, and to be humble at the same time. It is like water and oil. It will, they will never mix. It's always, uh, they are always at odds with each other. It will never mix being wealthy and being humble. Especially some of you maybe who are used to having maids, some of you who are used to having drivers, people doing things, you know, for you, giving you services. The temptation is always there, you know. We treat servants because they are servants. Brothers and sisters, this is not an attitude of a Christian person. See, James said this in chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of partiality. Partiality, I remember we talked about this yesterday or last night in our Bible study, having favoritism. James was talking about here about um, um, of people who were given special seats in the church because they were rich. Seating in the church, yung mga mayayaman sa harap. And then we, we are always tempted with that, that because of the, of the status of a person, because of its wealth, that we know that the person is, is rich, we give that person a special treatment and attention. And James is actually warning us to be very, very careful to these hidden ways by which we might show partiality because of our income. Because what we have is from God, brothers and sisters. And that we can think that our wealth is a sign of our own worth and value to God. No, brothers and sisters, it is not. It is not. It is not ours. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's, Hindi sa atin, and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. It is not ours. Be humble because we know that there is always pride that goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. So many rich, so many proud people face stumbling of their careers, stumbling down of their wealth and treasures because of their being proud. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. It is just so sad that in the Philippines right now, so many politicians who are even using the people's money are so proud, are so proud, bringing even the very Filipinos who are there, who are experiencing a lot of financial distress, putting them down. It's just so sad. We should be humble. And that means we should not assume that you either deserve or that you earned all of that wealth. First Corinthians 4, 7, this is a very, very good verse. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Some people will say because they have so good jobs, earning so much money, they say, oh, I have done my best. I am earning this because I deserve it because I am the one putting so much effort in my work. I tire so much every day I go to work. I put so much time in it. It's me who has 
who has done my work and therefore I deserve my very high salary. Brothers and sisters, have you forgotten? Whose body are you using to perform your work? Whose brain are you using? Whose talent, whose ability is it? Is it your own? Wasn't it from a body that was given to us? We have borrowed, we have our lungs in our body, a body that is so systematically, beautifully created by God. Everything is borrowed, even the air that we breathe. So we cannot boast, we cannot boast. Money is all from God. It is his, he is just letting you use it. You can never say that I made that money, it's mine, no. No. What mind did you use so that you can work so well? It is a borrowed mind, brothers and sisters, borrowed from God. Don't put value or worth on how much people have. Why? Because money is so uncertain. It is so uncertain. Each one has been given his talents and abilities and skills. Each one is God's masterpiece, God's handiwork, God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works prepared in advance for us to do. Brothers and sisters, Matthew 6, 26 is so beautiful. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Matthew 10, 30, 31. You are of value, unique value. Do not compare yourself with others, with others and do not judge and put price tags on others. There is, a very, there is a very young couple who are in ministry. This happened, true story in the US. And the, the wife wrote her pastor a very sad letter because she said, that my parents cannot accept my husband. We are newly married, but what we have been married for half a year, but my parents cannot accept my husband. So the pastor said, oh, why? Is there something wrong with your husband? Does he treat you unfairly or unjustly or, or not well? The, the, the lady said, no, pastor, my husband treats me like a princess, but what is wrong? Why are your parents not treating your husband well? Then the, the wife said, Pastor, my parents own seven cars and they are appalled that my husband and I, we share a 10 year old Honda Accord. You see, these parents are, are so rich that they have put a tag on the husband of their very own daughter. They just could not accept that their daughter married a godly, man without much money. My question to your parents, if you have children with um, girls, how much are you going to ask from the future husband of your daughter? What is the price tag of that man? How many cars should this man have for you to be able to accept? Is that your standard? for your daughter. That is just a question. Do not ever put value on people. The third, or, or sorry, nor, nor put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Material wealth, money, it fades. It's here now, tomorrow is gone. Let's not depend on our bank accounts, brothers and sisters, because like what I said, one day you're bankrupt. One day you lose your job. One day your business becomes bankrupt. Never ever depend on your bank accounts. There's a very interesting prayer from Agur, which, which um, we read in Proverbs 38.9. Let me read this. 
his prayer was, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. That was his prayer. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. How many of us have such prayers, brothers and sisters? And then a reminder to us from Proverbs 23, 4.5 regard, regarding us giving so much time in our riches. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches and are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Do not wear yourself out out to get rich, putting so much time on the work because we need to have that money. We have to, to get that promotion. We have to get that 2000 more in our salary. And then what happens? The family has been forgotten and most especially God has been neglected. No, that is the second command. We have to be rational, meaning use your own mind, reason, rational, put things in priority. That is the meaning of that command. Your wealth is a dangerous comfort, brothers and sisters. It's a deadly mirage. What is a mirage? Like in the desert, a mirage is an illusion, brothers and sisters. You see, in the desert, if you go there because of the reflection of the light, you know, if it hits an object, somehow uh, at a distance, you will see like a pool of water when you are in the desert because of the sun's reflection. Ganyan din po ang pera. Sometimes it gives us illusions, wild dreams. Let us not fall into that. Sabi po sa 1 Timothy chapter 6, 9, 10. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Two relationships are being destroyed when a person is in love with money. One, the neglect of his neighbors and two, his relationship with God is abandoned. That is the danger of money and wealth. Brother, the third command, be confident in God, meaning you put your hope in God. Why? Because it is God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. According to James, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or a shifting shadow. This is the positive command in verse 17. So rather than be satisfied with the gifts you have received, direct yourself and give thanksgiving to the giver of the gifts. He asks us to fix our hope in God, who is the true owner of everything on earth, because it is God who will richly supply us with all things to enjoy. This is also the same as what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not be anxious, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. A very beautiful verse, which all of us have memorized and yet quite, quite challenging to do. Our God is very generous and thoughtful to all of us. He will provide us with everything we need in order to do what he wants. He is not lacking for funds or, or ability, brothers and sisters. For as long as you fit, your hope on him he is very dependable and in fact God is lavish 
overflowing when he gives. Just look again at your apartment, brothers and sisters. See how many pairs of shoes you have there. You will be surprised with how wealthy you are. And then we hear from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, 18, 20. Um, Ecclesiastes is a book of wisdom written by Solomon. And this is what he says. And this is very, very thought provoking actually. Here is what I have seen to be good and fitting. This is what Solomon says. To eat, to drink and enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life, which God has given him. For this is his reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. This is contrary to the many misconceptions of many people who say that, oh, because these Christians, they are not allowed to have parties anymore, to laugh, to enjoy, and to be merry. This is the exact opposite of what Solomon is saying. God has given us the gifts and it is our reward given by God to enjoy what he has given us, the riches and the wealth he has given us. The fourth command is we have to be good to others. According to Hebrews 13, 16, we should not neglect doing good and sharing for with, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. In this verse, actually, Paul is saying the same thing two times. Command them to do good. He generalizes good, and then he enlarges on that, to be rich in good deeds. Rich in good deeds. According to 2 Corinthians 9, 10 to 11, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. So the giving here should not just be like cold and without thought giving. What the giving here, which is being said about, should be intrinsically and qualitatively good. It has to have the heart with it. When you give, it's not just supplying anything to somebody, but your heart must be in it. Do not forget the heart attitude when you give. Because when we give with a heart attitude, we are actually fixing our hope in God who is expecting that from us. Doing good and being rich in good works is the outflow of fixing our hope in God. So that is the meaning of this command. And brothers and sisters, when, when we give or, or our wealth should actually be to profit others. And that others is being talked about so much in Luke 6, 32 to 35. We have heard about these verses quite often. We have to include our enemies in that others. Because otherwise there's no difference between us and sinners if we are just going to give to the people who pay us, who are good to us. We have to love our enemies, as in verse 35, to do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back because your reward will be great and you will be children of the most high because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. If God is kind, even to the sinners, to the ungrateful and wicked, how much more should we be? The number five, we have to be generous and willing to share. And here we are mirroring God's care and generosity to us. For we know 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. So what God has given to us lavishly or overflowingly is not just for us, but we have to share it with others. Some of you may be thinking, I don't really have much to give. I don't even have much of this luxury. I understand that. We all understand that. It is never easy. But what God is saying here is that he is calling us to a life that, that is clear and the path is easy, that we can actually be both comfortable and yet sacrificial by looking at the others. God desires something from us, not to be so full of ourselves. He says in Matthew 7, verse 2, by the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Even if you have so little, so little, but then if you still think of the others, you don't have any, and you share, then God is all well. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7 to 11. I will not read this, but it explicitly tells us about being generous, that we have to be freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks. You shall generously give to him and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. Remember this, whenever you give you should not be grieved. Hindi na lulungkot. Yeah, it has to have the heart attitude. Um, oh, something's wrong. Right now, right now in the Philippines, there is a trend um, happening. I have taken some pictures here from Facebook of community pantries that are happening um, in, in, in the Philippines. I don't know, in some other countries, I think it's happening too. Here is a very good expression of generosity from people where people, people are just giving from their own money, from their own resources. Um, and and, and um, pe people are being helped, those who don't have anything actually those who don't have anything. So this is quite, quite um, popular and, and, and important in the Philippines right now. This is a very, very good expression of being generous. Lastly, in, in chapter, uh, in verse 19, we read here that in this way, we, we, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. We are being told here that our lifestyle right now is an investment. Yeah, that we are supposed to be focusing on heavenly treasures. Said in, in Matthew 6.20, this verse is quite popular, which we know very much. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. And also in Luke, it is being said that we have to sell our possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no more moth destroys. So when we invest in heavenly treasures, we're actually thinking of a return of investment, which will be unbelievable. So um, a return of investment. Kung may invest tayo, meron tayong... Um, return, dividends, mas malaki. So yan po ang sinasabi dito sa 41 verses 1 to 3. How blessed is he who considers the helpless. The Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. The Lord will protect him and keep him alive. And he shall be called blessed upon the earth. 
and do not give him over to the desire of his enemies. The Lord will sustain him upon his sick bed in his illness. You restore him to health. Ayan. So brothers and sisters, let us summarize the commands of Paul to said to Timothy to be given to the Ephesians are we have to be humble, to be rational, to be confident in God, to be good to others, to be generous, and to be focused on heavenly treasures. So with this, I would like to conclude, and I would just like to read this. As we do these things, we are placing treasure in heaven where it will be waiting for us for all eternity. That is what good investing looks like. Notice that we get money from God to be used for good. When we use it for good, we have great joy here and now. Then it is turned into a heavenly currency, which will be with us for all eternity. It is called a treasure in heaven. So that is how God wants us to use our money. Then as we let go of wealth in this life, our hand is free to take hold of what is truly life. Like what I said earlier, if you are listening to me right now, you are already wealthy by God's standards. So brothers and sisters, honor him with your worldly success. Enjoy the things God has sent your way while being respectful of others, rich in deeds and generous with the less fortunate. By doing so, your affections transfer from the money to the God who has left you a portion of wealth to oversee. Your heart is then free to treasure Jesus because there is a dynamic that connects your heart to your treasure. So when you release some of your wealth, you can be joyful because you have released your heart to find its true treasure who is our Lord. Jesus Christ. To God be the glory, brothers and sisters. <laughs>